Welcome everyone. There are a few new faces, I think, that I um, don't immediately recognise. So this talk is the is the third talk, but I decided to talk about two of the Bhajangas together today, the third and fourth Virya and Titi, rather than separately. And I, I think it'll become clear why as we go along. So first of all, the um, first one, Virya. Wednesday is Virya. And the, the Buddha Rupa for Wednesday is the Buddha holding the ball. This one is a fairly uh, modern image, whereas this one is much older. It's reputed to date back to the 16th century, but I think probably some restoration has been done, particularly on the head. So Buddha with Bol. Now, I've talked about these Day of the Week images before and the relation to the Bajangas, which is not really widely understood. There seems to be two traditions. One is the kind of cultural one, where lay people go to their local temple and they, if they want to make a, an offering or a puja, they choose the image that corresponds to their birthday. Um, and they usually, each monastery, most monasteries I've been in, have a set of seven of these images. And then there's the other tradition where the Bojangas are also associated with days of the week. And very little has been written down about this. So what I'm saying is, um, I guess, my interpretation. And um, you may have slight variations, and that's, that's absolutely fine. So the Virya, on the cultural side, the story is that it refers to the Buddha after his enlightenment visiting his birthplace, Kapilavatu, where his father was the regional king. And knowing that he was coming, his father arranged a, a, a big, big banquet. But surprisingly to everyone, the, the Buddha didn't turn up at the banquet. And in fact, um, he went on arms round through the town so that everyone, and eventually his family and father, etc., could uh, make an offering in the usual way to monks on an arms round. So the images of um, dana, generosity, um, dana in the sense of the person on the arms round, the Buddha in this case, is offering himself as a, if you like, field of merit for other people to offer food, which is ultimately something which is sustaining life. So dana and also nekama, renunciation. This is someone following a quite different path to going to the local restaurant or a banquet. So renunciation and dana, two of the ten perfections in the system of ten. But also virya, which may be less clear, but it's a new direction away from the kind of sensory world. It's a resolution um, in following this path, in making that statement to offer <coughs> oneself for dharma. So virya, and if you're born on a, a Wednesday, if you're born on a Wednesday, then Mr. Ripper, trusting who I see or speak of you. So, if you're born on a Wednesday, you might wonder what your connection might be to, to Viria. You know, it's a quite interesting one with Viria because I know, I know a few people quite well who were born on a Wednesday. And the interesting thing that I notice is that some of them, from time to time, feel they're actually quite lazy and lacking in um, bigger. Whereas other people 
observing them tend to think that they're rather driven characters. And that's saying something quite intriguing about what's actually going on in Hiryu. And probably why, you know, there's the, there's the option of working with that for yourself, whichever one corresponds to you. But with Viria, when I think of Viria and that image of the monk with the bowl, I can tell you a, a story which comes immediately to my mind when I spent uh, most of 1992 in a rural temple in Thailand. There was an old monk in the temple who was renowned in the villages nearby, highly respected, was in the 60s, for never missing an arms round in 40 years, more than 40 years. And the story was that he never missed whether he felt ill or not, rain or shine. And he, in his 60s, was quite prone to arthritis and rheumatism. So quite an effort for him. And one day on the, on the arms round, walking through the nearby town, he was at the head of the arms round. He had been for quite a few years because the abbot, who would normally be head, was confined to a wheelchair by then. And the, the arms, the line of monks suddenly came to a stop. So the monks behind were craning their heads forward, you know, wondering what's going on, what's the obstacle. But usually monks are actually quite in a, not a hurry, but they're looking forward to getting back to the temple and eating. And um, so it appeared that there was a, a family, a, a youngish couple with a little boy, asking the abbot something. And he was leaning towards them and he clearly didn't understand what they were asking, at least not to begin with. Then he, he did get the message of what they were asking him to do. And what they were asking him was to give the boy a blessing. This little boy looked to be about four or five, was very, very sickly, and apparently had been ill for a long time, and nothing had really helped. So they're asking the, the old monk to give a blessing, but a very unusual blessing. And to give the blessing, two younger monks had to support him on each side while while he placed his foot on the little boy's head the the couple the parents were kneeling down holding the boy up partly but still for the abbot to lift his leg up and place his foot on the boy's head he had to be held otherwise he probably would have fallen over and he did it with great aplomb, actually as though he had been doing it for years um, but the image is, was startling because, you know, in Thailand, lots of you have been to Thailand and they, or, or other Southeast Asian countries, it's a taboo to point your foot at someone. It's even greater taboo to point your foot at someone's head, but to touch someone's head is unthinkable. So this is like a kind of, was like a kind of reverse magic. The villagers highly respected this monk. He had walked barefoot because the practice in this temple was everyone walked barefoot. Every arms round, barefoot, no matter whether he was you know, feeling, struggling physically. And then the villagers believed that his determination, effectively, Viria, had imbued his feet with magical power. And that's why they asked him to give the boy a blessing. So, if you're in doubt about the connection between Viria and the image of the monk with the bowl, that um, is from what I would point to. So the image for PT is the Buddha in Samadhi on the night of his enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. Some of you may have actually seen this image on, when you've been on pilgrimage to India. <laughs> so why, why this particular occasion? as the night of the Buddha's enlightenment. So the story goes that the Buddha determined, made a resolution to sit um, under the Bodhi tree, no matter how long it took, until everything was finished, until he, no more doubt, no more questions, everything was completed. In other words, the statement of Virya. 
And then the, the first watch of the night, he was, according to the tradition, assailed by um, doubt, uh, pulls back into sensory, into the sensory world, Mara. It's described that he was confronted by Mara illusion. Whether Mara is real or not, it's standing for the last vestiges of attachment to the sensory world. And he overcame Mara, according to the tradition, and was filled by pity, filled by exhilaration and pity. And we're talking about both a mental but also bodily feeling, which led to the whole process unfolding over the rest of the night through the jhanas to eventual completion. With pity, if you wonder whether if you're born on a Thursday, you have a special connection to pity. I'm not sure how I would describe it, actually, because pity is difficult to pin down. You know, it's sometimes translated as joy. So does that mean that you're a very happy person? Um, but it's not exactly joy. Joy sounds like a, a feeling quite close to sukha, quite close to happiness. But pity feels when you're developing jhana much more like the body waking up and there is a kind of um, exhilaration in that so i'm not sure how you would place it for yourselves if you were born on a thursday whether you feel some connection to that or whether it's something you want to you feel you want to work on um, difficult to put into words so Coming back to the, the talk, not the, um, the other images. A quick recap for some of you who didn't listen to the previous two. The first two talks were on um, Sati and Dhammavichaya. And the, the gist of it was that Sati, in terms of meditation, corresponds to the, the first placing of attention to know where you are. It's like a mental act. In terms of our tradition, you could be placing attention on the number and the counting. And vichara corresponds to, sorry, not vichara, dhamma vichaya adds the quality of investigation, curiosity, meaning, not just placing your attention, but in introducing meaning, knowing something about your object, where you are, in our case, the breath particularly in the following to begin with. So when we were talking about those two factors, Sati and Dhamma Vichaya, even though they start in a very, very simple way, and in that simple way they correspond very well to um, Vitaka and Vichara, the early stages of developing the first root Vichara, and they also correspond to two aspects of attention in the brain in known to neuroscience. But even though they start off in a very simple way, I don't know whether this will make sense to you, but whenever we do that, whenever we start anything like that, there's an implication of where it's going to go, a kind of uh, possibility of completion. And so in the case of Sati, the full development would be all-encompassing sati, uh, samma sati. And the full development of Dhamma Vichaya would be panya, wisdom, two factors of the Eightfold Path. So even starting in a very simple way creates a kind of uh, possibility, direction. And so it's a very important act when we start meditation. In the Yoga Vichara that some of you have done, have practiced with, with me, um, in the Yoga Vichara, this corresponds to the invocation. Before you start a practice or anything in, in, in terms of a retreat, for example, in the Yoga Vichara, you, your first step is an invocation. Bring to mind the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, um, all the teachers that followed, right up to your own teacher, 
and maybe the his lineage, his teacher, and the teacher before him, down to you. And if you happen to be a teacher yourself, those you teach. And it sets up a kind of direction, a way ahead, which involves which involves area. And it's a direction which eventually will lead you to the path. And the reason I'm taking the two Bhajanga, Sturya and Bhiti together is because I think this is a major transition point in our practice. The first two factors, Sati, Dhamma, Vichaya, or in terms of Jhana, Vitaka and Vichara, are all connected with attention and actually very, very close to, to the sensory world. So someone practicing through a Vitaka Vichara approaches jhana, the sensory consciousness gets disrupted. Last time I showed this picture which is someone approaching developing Vitaka Vichara and the activity at the back of the head gets disrupted into little bursts rather than a random pattern, more continuous random pattern. And the, the each of the little bursts is a disruption to the networks in the brain that support the eye. The networks of attention in the brain that support everyday consciousness. And in between, we get little silences developing. So this is someone who is developing Vitaka Vichara, but actually is getting close to the first Rupa Jhana. And the fact that nearly everyone I recorded showed spindles of this form to some degree shows that within this tradition pretty well everyone who's completed the 16 stages has some sense of the first Rupa Jhana. You may not realize it but probably if I was recording you and you doubted that there would be spindles in your brain activity but you're not aware of them physically. So everyone to some degree is getting very close or actually touching on the first Rupa Jhana. But because it's so similar, so close to sensory consciousness, when you first touch on it, it can be very fleeting and you can may pop out into reflecting on it and go back into sensory consciousness. And so that's what would probably be called the, the simplest level of experience, momentary. And it could be middling, right up to someone who can control the processes mastered the first Rupa Jhana. Now, back in the 1960s, 1966, Nai Bhuman was asked by a monk in London, what do you teach? And this was the time when there was a, a new Thai temple in Ishim in London. And the monks who had come to populate that temple were all Vipassana practitioners because this was a time in the 60s, 70s, followed, where Samatha are pretty well being destroyed in Thailand. And so when Bhutan was asked a question like that, they suspected, some of them knew actually, that it came from the Samatha tradition. It was a loaded question. And normally he avoided questions like that because he was working at the Thai embassy. He was actually a kind of liaison person between the new Thai temple and the government, the Thai government through the Thai embassy. So he had to be very careful. If he elaborated on, I teach jhana, or I teach uh, all the jhanas, um, he would open himself up to criticism against this new orthodoxy of Burmese Vipassana. So he normally avoided it. But this was the only occasion I can remember where he answered the question. He answered it very simply, I teach the first Rupa Jhana. And why he chose to answer it on that occasion, I don't, I don't know exactly. Maybe he knew something about this monk, who it could be useful to that monk to know. But it's a, it's a very intriguing answer. I teach the first Rupa Jhana. And 
the meaning behind it is that if you can lead someone to experience the first Rupa Jhana, even briefly, even briefly they will touch on some degree of stillness and peace at the end of their practice. And they will never to some extent forget that. Even if they give up the practice for whatever reason, maybe their family reasons, career moving away, the, the tradition is that if you can lead someone to that experience, eventually they will come back and will want to follow it through. And actually the prime example of that is the Buddha himself. You, I'm sure you all know the story. But the Buddha followed all the leading teachers of his day and couldn't find the answer eventually to what he wanted. And then one day he remembered and recalled sitting on the banks of the river. I think the occasion was watching his father, the king, leading the plowing ceremony. And he was sitting on the banks of the river and dropped into the first Rupa Chana. And he recollected a feeling of deep peace effectively freedom from sensory consciousness, but experience only, just what he experiences is not thinking I exp I'm separating from sensory consciousness, but deep peace. And that led uh, the Buddha to follow the whole process of developing the charmers, and that was the essence of his teaching from that point on. So he got a pretty good example. So the point we're at, we're at now is a very important transition point from how do you move from the relatively straightforward experience of the first Rupa Jhana into the second and higher Rupa Jhanas. And in terms of the practice, this usually corresponds to someone starting to get familiar with the touch of the breath, the Taka of Vichara is mostly worked on in the counting and following. And getting familiar with the touch of the breath to begin with is, is another sensation, but it can become more and more subtle. And if you think of your own practice, <clears throat> you come to a point where once the Taka and Vichara are more or less established and more or less effortless, you are much more in the feeling mode and the beginnings of contentment arise. And it's usually nothing particularly spectacular. Just a contentment with you, you're quite happy to stay with the immediate experience and not be pulled back into thinking, labeling, recognition. And that contentment is not a cognitive process. It's a feeling state and it's much closer to a mental experience of your own consciousness or the quality of your own consciousness, which is a point usually where the nimitta sign arises. But because it's not a, a clearly cognitive process, it's tricky to remember. And if you touch on it and then come out of your practice later without recollecting it, it's easily forgotten. So this is, this is a key point in the practice to get familiar with that, that mode. And it's a mode which is the opening way to second and higher Rupa Jhana. So you start with contentment. No need to worry about the type of Vichara. The stillness itself is the satisfaction. And the breath naturally becomes more subtle. And there's the in-breath, the out-breath and the limiter. And the natural inclination is for everything to become more and more still. But on top of this, there's another level which is very in intriguing compared from the evidence of the brain study. At this point, the networks in the brain which are usually very complex, supporting our everyday consciousness, are no longer necessary. And a lot of the energy that usually supports that, effectively which supports our sense of I, is released as free for the meditator. So apart from the new direction, virya, 
becoming established. A, a new kind of invigoration, energy, pity comes in. And this is when the thick practice starts to open up into the rest of the jhana practice, PT Sukha Ekagata. So this is a very important transition point. And I'm mentioning it now because when we sit to practice later, just keep in mind that once you've established the track of the jhana in your practice, and you start to get that sense of contentment, and no, no need to go anywhere except where you are, it's actually beginning with equanimity and it will lead you right into the deeper levels of absorption and without cognitively having to control that process only to keep your mindfulness going and let everything settle so before we sit to practice I showed some of the EEG recordings last time. I want to show you some again for this stage of PT arising. Actually, the, the kind of my agenda here is to train a few amateur neuroscientists, so I'm not the only one able to think about these things. So, this first the recording. He's a meditator who is showing spindles. These little bursts in the back of the head, which I showed last time. So this is someone who's developed the Takara Vichara quite strongly. And after a while, that settles down and becomes established. something very different happens. Now I've chosen this record because it's a simplified record. This is someone who's practicing Buddha. So it's a simpler practice to develop the first Rupa Jhana, the Nanapanasati. And, and we actually have a few meditators within the Samatha tradition who, who know a little bit about Buddha. At the point that the person is given the instruction to develop Buddha, the tone on the in-breath, Bu, the syllable Bu, with the intention to arouse pity. And then on the out-breath, they intone Do, Do, Bu, Do. And you can see this happening. So I chose it because it's, it's a very, very simplified dis description of how pity arises. A few seconds after that instruction to, to start that practice, the frontal activity of the head, which is all to do with the kind of cognitive processing, is massively suppressed. The scale here is 150 microvolts per centimeter. So it's suppressed by about three, 400 microvolts. And the, normal everyday consciousness levels are about a tenth of that and then the temporal lobes this one is t3 and this one is t4 the temporal lobes are just above the ear inside the ear and they correspond to the auditory cortex so it's not surprising they get hugely energized with the book because it's a, an internal auditory syllable so they get highly energized and immediately afterwards so does the frontal lobe and then the sequence follows in the dough into relative stillness so a person practicing buddha would repeat this with quite long gaps in between increasingly long gaps in between where everything settles eventually into peace samadhi and jhana and the same thing happens in, in our practice of Anapanasati, but rather more complicated. So the second example is what normally happens in Anapanasati. So this is an example of someone who is about to develop the second Rupa Jhana. And so they've perhaps been sitting for a little while, and you can see at the back of the head, 
the slow waves developing, very slow. This is the time scale at the top here, 60, 70, 10 seconds. So the rhythm at the back of the head is about 15 seconds, 10 to 20 seconds, very, very slow. Because everyday consciousness is normally, the rhythms are often below or above one second. And there's a beginnings of a, a powerful slow wave at the front of the head. So the meditation here for this person carries on and the slow waves get stronger and stronger as he develops the second group of jhana. Until large areas of the head are showing this sort of activity. And this, the scale here is 200 microvolts per centimeter. So these are very powerful. You know, the, this one here, for example, the peak to the trough is about easily six, 700 microvolts. So this is far, far stronger than you normally see. In fact, the only comparable recordings of slow waves in everyday neuroscience are in deep sleep or in coma. And for a start, they're not as slow as this. They tend to be about five to 10 times faster than in meditation. But they're nothing like as powerful. They're normally about, um, these are probably about five times more powerful. If you look at the activity across the whole head by doing, I can show you a, a very quickly the spectra. Uh, okay, so the, these are the, the activity across the whole head. Delta is the slow waves. Theta is the kind of waves you normally see when you're drowsy. Alpha is the resting state, mostly at the back of the head. Beta is the kind of thinking rhythm. This is dominated by slow activity at the front of the head. And here you see the beginnings of the vertical axis. Uh, those of you who read the paper that was published will recognize this as the beginnings of, of jhana consciousness at the crown of the head. The third one, so slow waves, this is a signature of, of a very strong PT. Sometimes this very strong PT can get unstable. And the third example is an example of someone trying to develop the first Arupa Jhana infinite space, but going into the practice too quickly. And so the back of the head you, you see these little rhythmic spikes coming. I'll show them more clearly later. The only time you normally see these in neuroscience in, is in absence of epilepsy or children. And they're not normally confined to the back of the head. But this person is, is not dropping into an absence or not dropping into unconsciousness. He's actually highly alert and is totally unaware that this is going on apart from a feeling of more energization to some degree. The person is making too much effort. And that comes from the kind of discussion we have after these recordings to get the kind of subjective experience. Later on, this happens for this person, a massive, strong, slow wave, like the Buddha practice, which is Intriguing because some samatha meditators with no experience of Buddha find themselves doing it almost automatically. So this person goes into a very strong slow wave, which if you look at the, at the peak, that's the left hand plot. And if you then go into the trough, like that, or even more of a trough there. There's an oscillation from very high excitation to very strong suppression. And it's very much for this person, it's like an automatic way of evoking stillness by exciting everything to a very high level, PT, and then a form of passivity, which is what happens in Buddha. And at the back of the head, you can see the, the spike waves here. 
You know, the people who are going to spike raves. I've had to reduce the low frequencies to fit this on the screen. If I open the whole thing up to show you the real picture of all the frequencies, from very low to very high, I have to turn the gain down to 500 microvolts per centimeter. So this wave here, from the, from the minimum to the maximum, is almost 3,000 microvolts. That's about a 10 times increase. No, no, 100 times, sorry. 3,000 compared to 30 in the rest of the state. There's 100 times increase in voltage, which means that 100 times squared in power. So the power that's coming out at this point for this person, for this short period, is 10,000 times what you would see in a resting state. Now, in 2017, I made the mistake of submitting a very brief paper to one of the leading journals, showing just some of the key features. And this, not this particular record, but some of the records show very high intensity levels. And the reviewers didn't believe it, the paper was rejected. They, they, they basically thought it was a load of um, nonsense. <laughs> and the spike waves, if you look at them in more detail, This is what goes on for some people without any awareness. There's no way of knowing this is going on. This is why I'm showing it to you. So the back of the head, if I take this trace, you can see the spike waves very, very clearly. They're almost metronomic, just like in, to some degree, like absence epilepsy, except are not quite the same. They vary dif different people, different frequencies, whereas childhood absence epilepsy is pretty well fixed. Also in epilepsy, the recovery between spikes is smooth. In meditators, you get harmonics. And the reason for that is also very interesting because when you withdraw from everyday consciousness, the thalamus in the core part of the brain is triggered into this kind of ringing reverberation. Desperately trying to find a way to re reconnect to a network like it normally does in sensory consciousness. Anyway, that's, I think, enough neuroscience. Okay, so we've come to the point of doing uh, some meditation practice and in a minute, I'll share the screen while I light the candles and incense and then chant the um, short form of the recollection. I'd like someone to follow that by chanting the Itipi. So, Debbie, would you like to volunteer to chant the Itipi? So, uh, yes, I can do. Is Mark around here in this? Lot of pictures. Mark, would you chant the meta sutta? You'll have to turn your microphone on when you do it. <clears throat> yes, I will. Yes. Okay. All right. So we're ready to start. After the chanting is finished, I'll sound the bell. We'll sit for 20 minutes or so. Go into your own practice in your own way and bear in mind what we're talking about.
Rahang Samba Sankoto Bakawa Utang Bakawantan Apiwa Devi Swakato Bakawata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami Sipati Pano Bakawato Sawaka Sanko Sanghang Namami Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sam ma sam buddha sanamo tasa bhagavato arahato sam ma sam buddha sanamo tasa bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambudaksa. Iti piso bagawa arahan Samma Sambud Ovija. Charana Samba no Sugato Loka Vidu Anutaro Puresa Dhamma Saratisa Tadewa Manusanan Buddho Bhagavati Swakato Bhagavata Dhammo Sanditiko Akaliko Ehipasiko Opanahiko Pachatang Vedita Bovinyuhi Supati Padno Bhagavato Sawaka Sangho Ujjupati Padno Bhagavato Sawaka Sangho Nyaya Pati Padno Bhagavato Sawaka Sangho Sami Chipati Pamno Bhagavato Sawaka Sangho Yadi Dancha Tari Purisa Yugani Ata Purisa Pugala Esa Bhagavato Sawaka Sangho Ahune Yo Kahune yo, dakine yo, amjali karane yo, anutaran punya ketam lokasati. Yasanu bawato yakka. Ne wadasenti bim sanang yam hi chewa nu yun jan to ratin di wamatan di to sukang supati sutto chapa pang kinchi napasati ewam adi guno petang paritantang. Banamahe Karani Yamata Kusalena Yantang Santang Padang Abisamecha Sako Uju Chasu Uju Chasu Wacho Chasamudu Anatimani Santus Sako Chasu Baro Cha Ap Baki cho cha salahu ka wutti Santin rio cha nipa ko cha appa gambu kule su ananu gido 
Nachakudang samachare kinchie na winyu pare yu pawadeyum. Suki no wa ke mi no hon tu sabbe satanta ba wan tu suki tata. Ye ke chipan na buta tita sa wa ta wa ra wa ana wa se sa. Di ka wa ye mahanta wa majima rasaka anukatula. Dita wa ye cha atita ye cha dure wa santi awidure. Bhuta wa sampa we si wa sabbe satta bhavan tu sukitatta. Naparo param ni kube tanati manye takata chinam kinchi. Viaro sana patika sanya nanya manya sadukka mitcheya. Mata yata niyam putang ayusa e kaputta manurake. E wampi sabbabute sumana sambhava ye aparimanang. Me tancha sabbalo kasmimana sambhava ye aparimanang. Udang ado chatiri ancha asambadang awe ramasapatang. Di tancharam nisino wa sayano wa ya watasa wikata mido. E tang sati madite ya brahma me tam viharam midamahu. Di tincha anupagamma sila wadasane na sampano. Kamesu vineya gedang na hijatu gabba seyang. Punareti. I'm placing this practice today in the Milton Keynes Center so that it doesn't feel too neglected. So I'll sound the bell in a minute and we'll practice for about 20 minutes and I'll sound the bell at the end. So try to stay with the, the stillness that you just experienced for a few moments before you um, move too much, physically or mentally. And then what comes out of that stillness when you start to return to normal, normal functioning, normal cognitive functioning. So if anyone wants to verbalize anything, a few words, doesn't matter what, it's almost certainly going to be of interest to other people in the group. Because even though we're in the virtual space, there's still a, a connection. So if you want to verbalize or say something, please do. And there's no need for anyone to respond. And then if a second person wants to say something, maybe totally different, not a response to the first one, then do so. And then maybe a third person. And let's just see what, what comes up. Probably something that's interesting to me, relevant to the whole group. 
Um, yeah, what, what came to mind for me was, um, and Paul was talking in the talk about being unaware of these um, kind of spikes in activity, spindles. And I was just wondering whether in fact we are on some level kind of almost just kind of below our normal awareness, aware of these kind of changes and actually part of us wanting to kind of go with it and part of us maybe kind of resisting that change and just interesting the extent that we feel able to let go into this kind of really quite when you look at it on the chart a dramatic change in our consciousness and the extent to which we kind of hold back from that and try and maintain our sense of normality and that kind of tension between those two quite different ways of experiencing things when we're in the practice. Yeah, following on from what Grill said, um, <clears throat> I found in the in the first two stages, particularly bearing in mind the Takra and Pachara, that of this real stillness and um, <clears throat> gentleness, um, um, and could feel that sense of what Paul was saying about you were saying Paul about contentment, and then as it went deeper, just this massive sadness. And then it's quite difficult to know how to deal with that. Yes, and I think, again, following on from what Anne has said, um, it, it seems... Um, I can't hear you very well, Francis. Sorry, okay. It um, seems... Part of it is allowing ourselves to experience in the kind of body, or perhaps in the mind body, fully what starts to come up, um, and whether it's <coughs> some sort of kind of subtle, subtle um, energy. Or, or it's sadness or some other experience. Um, it's as though if it, if it goes to, to thoughts or to um, almost even to labeling, um, that can get in the way of just allowing it to be experienced in the body or in the mind. Um, and it, to me, sometimes it feels as though the whole heart is being stretched almost when when things start to develop um, and when almost allowing oneself to be stretched um, internally um, uh, but, but not always easy maybe one more before i leap in Yes, I was, I was sort of wondering it about orientation in, in a sense of that, that move from whatever the cognitive world seems like to a sort of world of feeling and sensation that one, I guess, gets familiar with um, in various ways. But I, suppose my, I don't know if it's a sort of a clear question, but a sense of what orientates one at, it, at that point. Um, it, 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 I guess it might be what one brings into the practice, so a sort of intention mm. and how one begins and continues, what one's familiar with, and maybe also what, what, what arises and takes one in interest. Maybe a little bit of what we were saying in terms of the pull between moving back to the normal orientation and, and then whatever one is working with that's new. But I suppose it's just a, a question, really, you know, where one finds that orientation in in that sort of different sort of space. Paul, earlier on you, you spoke about um, was it wake, waking up the body or engaging with the body or coming to know the body in a different way. So what, what was coming up in, in, in the practice was something about the different lengths of breath. Boonman um, often spoke of linking each of the jhanas to the different length of breath. 
And I'm wondering about the different qualities of Piti Sukha that arise in the different lengths of breath. In, in a way, my question arises from Paul, Paul Beck's question, which is about orientation. That, that there's something about Bloomman reminding us that the duty of mindfulness is to have this awareness of the length of breath. But when one is very concentrated and working with pity, the sense of the length of breath is very subtle. It, you know, it's not completely connected with the, with the physicality of the body anymore. So I, I suppose my question is something around the quality of the PT. It seems to me that the, the PT isn't, as it were, a, a a particular experience, it's, it, it, it's something you're wrapped around or working with the length of breath is, I suppose, is my kind of question or query or um, a desire to explore further. So, so thinking of those comments backwards, what, what you're saying, what David is saying, is in a way leading straight into probably the next talk around um, PT and how it is incorporated into samadhi by tranquilization, by passivity. Um, but it'll come into what the response is, I guess, to the other questions. So again, in no particular order. So going backwards, Paul, you mentioned about the, uh, what, is, what is it that sets the kind of direction at that point? Because you could, in the beginning, you can imagine as a relatively inexperienced beginner coming to this point perhaps quite quickly. Uh, in the first year or the second year, you've uh, done quite a lot of work on the Taka Vichara. You come to the um, touching and then the beginnings of the settling. And there isn't really a clear direction for many people. And so often it doesn't develop easily. So it's very, very important that the, the, the teacher is knows how to kind of steer you in the right direction. And that can be in all kinds of ways, through Dhamma talk, through which sets an, an idea, a sense, a feeling of being connected to a lineage, maybe the teacher's own lineage, just simply by the way he explains things and directs the practice. Um, in the Yoga Vachara, deliberately invoking the lineage, and so then you sit to practice, you let all that go, but it's still latent as a kind of way forward to let go of the complexities of everyday thinking to something you've not experienced before, which itself is a kind of direction. To be able to let go into something you've not experienced before. And that takes quite a lot of confidence and courage. And again, it depends on the context, and the teacher can be very important, but also the group. So sitting in a group is very, very helpful at this stage, because even if you don't have a clear direction of your own, across the whole group, there will be a direction. And that can be very, very helpful to allow you to let go and feel more confident. It's as though the group is more able to tie into the lineage because it kind of supersedes the details of each individual person's connection to that lineage. So there's that. And then we went into the practice after showing the brain activity and the, the what actually happens when we move beyond Vitaka and Vichara, and PT starts to arise, energy is released. And it's like Boomman would say, you know, when he gets people to sit in front of the class in a meditation retreat, and ask them to show how powerful the practice can be, you know. Now, now Boomman used to love to do this. And you look at the records in the brain, and it is indeed extremely powerful. And you can, with no doubt, feel it in the body, as, as um, Francis was saying. 
the energy is the, like a waking up of the body, is the way I would say would see it. And you could literally see it in the <clears throat> in the brain activity. One of the records I just showed, the person who was showing very very strong slow waves, actually progressing through the second towards the third rupa jhana, you could see the core crown of the head in in that record just behind the crown of the head becoming very strong. So a vertical axis develops quite different to the front back axis of subject object in sensory consciousness. I wonder whether that's connected to what you're experiencing subjectively, Francis, in the stretching. The subtle feeling of connection between the the head, the mind and the body. And this sense of being the body being very involved at this stage is, is very important to understand a little bit more and play with it yourself. For example, quite a number of people in Samatha are doing something like Tai Chi or, or Qigong or martial arts and they found it extremely helpful. But you don't have to be a, um, an expert in that, you can invent it. And so if you're doing any of the, you know, the, the, the movements, typical of Tai Chi, like even just moving your arm very slowly from one side and then maybe to another. If you watch someone who's really feeling the movement, you get a flavor of the same thing that we're talking about in meditation. And in, in terms of jhana, what's described in jhana as the fine material is, I think, getting familiar with that level of very subtle bodily sensation. So anything that helps with that, you know, you can invent it for yourself. It helps you get familiar with that level so that it's not too much of a, of a shock. Because, as um, Anne was saying, you know, this is very powerful. And when you go into that mode where the, the whole thing becomes connected, the body and mind, then it can release all kinds of experiences, sometimes blissful, sometimes very sad, which are often contained in the body, as well as trace memories in the, in the mind, in the brain. And people who've been practicing for, say, a substantial amount of time, Five, ten years, certainly ten years, invariably find that it will release at this point some trace memories, not necessarily verbal mem memories of something happening, but memories of feeling memories. And it can be a great release. It can also, if you're not familiar with it, be slightly disturbing. But the more familiar you get um, and become able just to stay with it on that feeling level then it's very healing. Yes, it is kind of connected to that. Um, I was thinking also that sometimes that kind of really deep sadness can be about a kind of recognition of, um, of that there isn't, <laughs> there isn't a me in the way that we take it to be and that that's and that can be um i could be sad because that's because that is what we can feel about that that sort of sh shift and 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 change and and the impermanence and so forth and that's why that connection to the Brahma Viharas is also if one is in a position that that is there mm. um, to to have great compassion for ourselves and and metta and and at points equanimity but it seems to me to be part of a process 
it's you might you know you you did we use the term or was the term used earlier about a kind of falling away and so so like that quality yeah 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 i think it was terribly important because you know we're in a situation where there's a lot of suffering and we see lots of examples on the news of people dying alone um, and, and their children and their families not able to be there when they die or say goodbye And that can come as a real shock to those those people, and it arouses when you hear those thoughts um, a whole mix of feelings, including compassion, sadness, and so on. In some sense, I agree completely that this um, letting go of the kind of all the things that support the sense of I in the sensory consciousness is it's a huge challenge to identity and what does identity mean you're still aware acutely aware so consciousness doesn't disappear but it doesn't disappear until way way forwards through the not just the root vaginas but the arrow vaginas and consciousness is still there so this is going to come up the feeling of of um, it could be loss on another occasion it could be freedom um, so there's a lot to get familiar with in a way some people would describe it as almost like getting prepared for or preparing for your own death and needing to understand you know the the, the supports for for sustaining your core sense the Brahma Vihara is definitely meta loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity at points, all at one point or another, and mixed together. And this is so important, I think, with what's, what's going on now. People, in a way, are being forced into dealing with some of these things. But undoubtedly, in meditation, this happens at this point in the practice in a very, very personal, deep, deep way. Earlier on, sometimes your, te your meditation teacher might have uh, suggested um, coming out of Samatha and the moment before you leave and get up, bring to mind uh, the three signs of impermanence, Anisha, impermanence, Dukkha, suffering, and Anatta, no self. Similar thing, but actually in the stage we're talking about in the separating from uh, sensory consciousness, it happens much, much more directly. You don't have to bring to mind any external memory or symbol of any shadow of Anita. It's in, it's in your direct experience. So this is terribly powerful. Very different to most of the kind of mindfulness, the pastoral traditions. Yeah, there's a kind of, when you put down a burden, there's relief. If you've been carrying heavy shopping bags and you put them down, there's a relief. Or when you realize you've been carrying something that you hadn't previously realized you've been carrying and you put it down, there's a kind of relief mm. and joy in that. Mm. Yeah. You know, when uh, Nibuman started to teach the formless jhanas, um, to some extent, he, he did it slightly reluctantly. We had to nudge him for a couple of years. And then he started to teach the uh, formless jhanas. And some people, it aroused quite a lot of fear. Because even the more of a challenge is to feel that you don't have um, the, the support, sort of the familiarity of the limiter. And the structure of Rupa Jhana. But I remember one practice where it started to really kind of make sense to people in one of the retreats he took. 
Um, and towards the end of that retreat, he asked people to, in between practices, if they wanted to, walk in the grounds, the, you know, the extensive grounds of the Samatha Center, beautiful surroundings. And, um, and bring to mind nothingness or emptiness. So it must have been the stage where during the retreat we come to the point of talking about the third arrow pajama, nothingness. And people in the evening meeting, the Dhamma discussion, what came up was, was very interesting. Um, if that had been asked maybe a few years earlier when the beginning of introducing it, I think we would have got a very, very different response. But the theme for quite a few people was giving, giving the attention while walking to background awareness of nothingness or emptiness. It aroused a feeling of a great spaciousness and freedom. No fear at all. I just wanted, can I say something? I've just, uh, in the light of what everybody's been saying, I was just going back to um, the experience in settling of, it's, it seems another way, um, it seemed to me like it was a, a coming, if it's a coming together of mind and body, there's going to be all that sort of mixing that's going on of sorting out sukha from dukkha. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when one's within the settling, it, it just struck me in the light of the comments about dukkha arising is that that's always, I've always found it quite interesting. Paul mentioned it once before, not repressing dukkha, but then on the other hand, the fear of proliferating dukkha as well in that situation. And for me, I was just thinking about it and we've been you know, doing a Abhidhamma, Dhamma Sangani group, and looking at Javana, which is a sort of Kama consciousness as it takes over. And it's almost like it's a very, that sort of happening at that level. But we have a choice, a beautiful, um, subtle choice at that level of changing the course of that Javana a consciousness or something. And how do we do that? Well, the, the gift, it seemed to me, that my boom in this offer this is the gift of the breath and it's almost like that to me is where the length of the breath comes in and also in also with what Paul talked about right in the first talk about when we talked about mindfulness connected with this practice there was a very strong link with samatha but um that actually recalling it, what length of breath is helpful at that point and that almost gives one the space to be able to reconnect with the object of practice because usually what will have happened at that point is this was a, a subtle level it seemed to me the of my experience anyway it's uh, you've lost the object and it's almost like the point where confidence and faith and trust is needed is at that point where you notice that that dukkha is there you're allowing it to be present, but then you're almost having to hand over to the body the knowledge of what the breath is that's needed and trust, and then just lightly keep awareness of that sort of length of breath. And, and that gives you then the space to recollect. Perhaps you need to go back of consciousness to, to sort of recollect where, what the object is at the time. And, and then knowing that that in our practice is our safety, isn't it? It's our safety net is sort of recording our, our sort of, it's just a thoughts as everybody's talked about it. Well, I think you described it very well. And, and actually the process you're describing, as you know, behind what you're trying to put it into words, is a very subtle process. It, it's uh, very delicate. And I think you describe it, described it very, very well. Um, maybe also, maybe we're just thinking of time is coming up to 12 o'clock, whether that's quite a good point to end on. Um, there's already a direction here which 
needs to go further. But we can't fit it all in today. But you can all already sense once you've set up the beginnings of the second group of jhana, the the whole process is somehow known. And in the talks that were and the questions and the comments that are coming out, you can recognise some of that. That there's already a connection through to what else, what, what else we're going to consider and talk about in these talks on the agendas. So I'm going to um, sign off at this point. Um, thank you all for, for coming. Thank you, Paul. Thank, thank, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.